Thank you to the Karen YouTube audience for tuning in, and thank you to those of you who are here as our captive audience for the day, and uh, to any who might be watching on the live stream or on campus. Uh, I feel very inspired by a musical offering by one of our current uh, clients, um, and uh, his courage, I hope, inspires me uh, to just um, let the message be what it is meant to be. Uh, there's a one-word pointer to the subject matter in which I have been uh, paying attention, constancy. And uh, it's not a word I used a lot as a young man. So I remember when I was reading an essay while I was in seminary by the renowned controversial theologian Stanley Hauerwas, um, uh, that uh, this was uh, interesting to me. I was like, what, what is this constancy thing? And, Hauerwitz's point in this particular essay was that constancy is a difficult subject to summarize, appropriate, and speak about, and that his claim was that unlike other virtues of the human life, prudence, patience, humility, um, I, I, I don't consider myself an expert in virtue, but uh, there are these other ones, constancy is one that Hauerwitz said we can only really come to appreciate in story. And that um, if you look in narrative fiction in particular and look at characters who exhibit this beautiful way of being in a relationship that we could describe as having constancy, um, that that is something that uh, a quick capsule summary doesn't really convey. It's because constancy is not easy and um, this is a rich and deep subject. And I think it has immense bearing on people who are affected by substance use disorder in ways I'd like to illuminate. And then I think it's um, uh, more universal and important in our time, um, and perhaps in all time. And then, finally, I think there's uh, methods that can help us manifest constancy in the relationship. And so all that's on my ambitious agenda for the next um, passage of time here. So, uh, where to begin? I believe that human beings are wired for relationship. And I'm not alone in that. Um, there's a lot of theory to support what I'm about to speak about. And I learned a new way of speaking about our relational wiring this week as I was preparing for the message today. And what I was studying, because it's a thing that people look at and how we become connectors, is early child development. And I was given um, inspiration from a metaphor that is used in studying and teaching people in early child development, which is a met metaphor that comes from racket sports. And the metaphor is serve and return. So if you've never played table tennis or, uh, God forbid, pickleball or whatever it is, <laughs> um, uh, and I don't know anything about that sport other than it's uh, quite popular these days, but I've played board sports before, and so I think you have uh, I think we sort of know, even if we're not board sport or racket sport people, what the serve and return idea is. And where this phrase is used in connectional hardware thinking is um, that uh, it's, it's used as a way of describing the interaction between an infant and a primary caregiver, usually a mother. And so, um, to stay very simple with all of my uh, things, I'm going to stick with a mom and a baby, and then I'm going to talk about alcohol only, but you may want to generalize because families are different today, and uh, always have been, but today I think we understand that families may not always manifest with specific gender roles or whatever. So primary caregiver, I'm going to call a mom, and primary substance use disorder, I'm going to call alcoholic. But all that could get much more messy and complex. So. The serve and return thing is beautiful and interesting. I love watching it. My, my wife is by nature a mom, and I call her a child whisperer. She is great with the infants that we now have in our circle. We have a five and a 10 year old granddaughters, and then we have some infants that have been born to the nieces and nephews in her extended family. My um, family probably is gonna stop with me and my siblings, but um, biologically, not. Um, because they're adopted kids and my nieces and nephews. That they'd be offended if I forgot to say that. So, but watching my wife with these infants in a substitute role, so you know, we're at a birthday party or whatever, and, and 
Judy is my wife's name, and she says, you want me to hold Scarlett? And, um, and Judy plays Serve and Return in such a natural and gifted way that it's as if the baby doesn't even know there's been a swap. But there has been, because the baby wants to play Serve and Return with its primary caregiver. And this is pre-verbal, so this is like, and even eye contact doesn't really happen a whole lot um, because brain hardware is not richly developed to do persisting relationship in the way we expect it because I can look at this room and, they, and I can see you seeing me see you in a half a second and that tells me that we're making a connection but with a baby, like the, the eye can pass you by and you, you may think they're not paying attention but oh my gosh, they're just, whoosh, data sinks. And so they're taking in all this information and one of the things that a baby is taking in is whether you play tennis with them and they're served because it's like, ah, or smile or, you know, or fidget or whatever. And all that stuff is coming out into the world and a good partner in the game responds to it by adjusting the hold and by cooing and by mimicking and by consoling and whispering and and it turns out that heart regulation, blood pressure, a variety of other telemetries, and sadly, stress chemistry begin to be uh, engineered into this young organism at this period of time. So if I'm an infant, which I sometimes act like one, and I'm like, Yay, and I get no serve return back, my cortisol, my stress hormone, begins to become activated. And the next thing you know, I'm a, I'm a disgruntled brat. And there's kind of no escaping it. That may be part of how I need to develop. It helps build resilience, absolutely all that stuff. But unfortunately, it can also create a very stressed out child. And it's less than optimal. And one of the, the an optimal, I talked last week about good enough. Good enough means that on most days, most of the time, serve doesn't go unanswered. And in fact, serve gets answered skillfully enough that it's not stressful, it's to some degree at least consoling or baseline, right? And so this is how we develop as human beings, is we need to be in relationship in order to, and this is all evidence shown that it's about brain architecture development. So this is how we develop into having communication skills, into having relational skills, into understanding meaning and purpose in life. All this stuff starts to happen by this pseudo racket sport that is manifested in the interaction between the infant and the mother or caregivers. And I know it sounds like I'm way off course, totally not. This is really relevant to where we are today because we are all products of this kind of development to some degree, well done, less well done. And my perception after 15 years of work in this field of addiction medicine and also with a number of years more than that in my own sobriety and coming out of my own family, which as I've hinted is a little not as connected to some others. Um, my, my estimation anecdotally is that people who have a caring connection, which means that addiction has somehow touched your life, as a rule are relationally impaired. You want to be offended? You could. Because I do mean it as a sad finding that those who come to this place don't necessarily play the adult version of serve and return, as well as some others. And this is a big difference between us and others. In the AA world, they call them normies, normal, non-addicted people. Play serve and return in the adult sphere better. That's my claim. And so this affects our marriages, our friendships, and our uh, belonging in different settings. And it may not be otherwise evident in every other sphere of our lives, but it's, it's where we make relationship and where we make connection that we can find some degree of high stress and limited skill that is then manifest with this intense connectedness to a relationship, behavior, or substance. So to me, that's what addiction is, if you want a definitional understanding from Reverend Jack. It's when my connective hardware, 
which should be connecting with myself, with other people, with the natural environment, and with whatever I understand is the ultimate source of being. Because there's a lot to connect in that menu of domains. But I become less and less skillful in connecting in those ways, because I become more and more dependent, that's an old addiction word, or pseudo-connection with the alcohol, with the um, you know, unhealthy paid sex worker, or with um, the FanDuel casino app on my phone, or um, the credit card that I burn a hole in. Or I, and it's my very connectional apparatus that is, I'm gonna say God-given, or anthropologically built in. That's not bad, I'm not a bad person because I need to connect, but it's tragic that where I seek to meet my need for connection is in these wells that are poisoned. They're, they're you know, bad substitutes at the, at the most generous level, and they're painful for those who love and care about us to watch us become more and more adept at, like, Finding, this is an NA phrase, finding and using and finding ways and means to get more. That becomes the skill of connection or the, and, and, and with this language is all in the attic world. I'm gonna hook up, I got connections for you, you know, and get a fix. Like the, the language betrays the depth of significance that the addictive experience has for us, and I say us because I'm one, and, and this is part of why it becomes so hard for us to become long-term clean and sober. Because we can pause, we can abstain for an interval. But in that abstention, we become hungry for alternative connection. And the very first things that present themselves are false friends. They're um, no good substitutes. And uh, this is when my mom says, I don't want you hang out with him because he's a bad influence, right? And she can see that, like, this is just not a good idea anyway. It's not a relationship that's going to enhance my connectedness long term. So um, I, I'm, I'm happy I skipped a bunch of stories to get to this point, laying up all this background. But I also do want to say that I agree with Horowitz that at some level, this finally gets to be something that we only really get to know in the experience of walking our day-to-day -day lives. And um, I had a ton of things I was gonna talk about, but the one that looms largest in my heart at this moment is to talk about marriage. Um, and the only way I can claim to know something about marriage is because I am in my second one, so um, that's pretty good. In one sense, it's not the fifth. And to me, I know more than I did in the first. And I'm intrigued by people who proclaim themselves as experts on marriage without having ever even tried one and, and, and saying that they can't, you know, sort of what I'm talking about. But um, uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to work on this thing that we call marriage. And marriage to me is like the consummate manifestation of constancy in our sphere. And it's, it's the, and I, you know, if you look carefully at the theology of wedding rites, R-I-T-E-S, they depict the sacrament, the sacredness of the marriage union as something of an echo of the love of God in the world. And that sets a really high bar for those of us who decide to entertain the attempt of being godlike in our love for one another. But, um, but maybe not so. And just like there's good enough parenting, there's good enough husbanding and good enough wifing, and I hate to be overly standardized about that too, because I know there, it gets more complicated than that um, always has, and, and now we talk about it these days. So, I had this belief that my marriage, in my first marriage, just would, was a promise of eternity, right? That I was like, the, the, the marriages are inviolable and that you never leave them. 
And I had a story, in fact, I used to tell myself that no one in my family had divorced because I repressed the truth. My oldest brother had divorced. But it was like one of those silent secrets. We didn't talk about it. So it was as if it didn't happen. So then when I was like in the misery of the struggle to sort of create authentic, healthy relationship with this other being who had very significant compromise herself, uh, I think we both brought this principle that we, we just, you know, no, we never leave. And the reason I go here is partly because it's so darn real for many, if not all of us in the room, but also because I think most of us know that simple binary ideas about marriage don't always work. Like, you, you can't always be together, you can't always be apart, you can't always be, uh, uh, even like the old ideas of uh, head of household and, you know, domestic, servant um, are antiquated and unsuccessful and even probably were long ago but are now. And what I came to realize, I am watching time, but I, I came to realize at a certain point in my first marriage after multiple attempts at therapy and all these different ways of trying to reinvent myself and watch her try to reinvent herself, whatever it was, I got permission as it were from a therapist who helped me to look and see that what I was holding to was an idea that wasn't echoed in a reality. That in essence, I didn't have a marriage. What I had was this persisting attempt to create one out of a cohabitation agreement. And that helped me like acknowledge a reality, which was that our relationship had long ago devolved into no longer being all that I think a marriage is supposed to be. It, it lacked attributes of the marital relationship that today in my second marriage are the defining characteristics that help me know I'm in a marriage because actually I'm like in a commuting marriage. So I'm in my marriage only three days a week uh, in Delaware and I'm up here at work four days a week, which is very weird, I know, I got it. But, but my marriage has other hallmarks that tell me I'm in a marriage. Constancy is a good way of capturing a whole bunch of that. <sighs> So, things we haven't talked about that I would talk about if I wanted to take another half an hour. Um, tough love, that's part of what makes this a difficult subject because when I talk about constancy, I'm not saying that it doesn't have boundaries. Um, uh, trauma, like one of the bad behavior on the part of one of the constituents of a constancy relationship is another thing that needs to be sort of nuanced because what happens is that if I'm wounded because I haven't had trust and safety in relationships, and when you offer me a relationship, I may get my hackles up. I have a cat that does this. She just completely doesn't get it, that the grandchildren want to just love her. And she gets all like And also, interestingly, when other women enter the household. So there's something about that. But that's a trauma-informed response, in my understanding, is that people who have wounds don't do relationship well for those reasons, as well as we may not, because we're used to connecting to bad channels, and often those are sort of the same thing. But that doesn't mean that the relationship shouldn't be attempted nonetheless, right? And so when I'm in brat mode, I don't want you to abandon me, because if you abandon me when I'm in brat mode, it makes me think that you were not safe, and there's no relationship to be had. And I'm not asking for you to co-sign permanently my unsuccessful attempts at relationship, but in a funny way, being a brat may be my best attempt at a relationship. So this is, it's, it's, it's so gosh darn hard. And then you're like, well, what do I do? Like, what, what, what do I do? And I just want to say one thing. You are here, which is testimony to participation in an attempt at constancy in some relationship. You would not be in relationship with Karen if you didn't want this to be better, or to continue to be better, having had it then not what you wished it would be. That's what sort of defines who we are. So for a moment, applaud yourselves, just to not have a bit in your heart, like, yay, we're a community that's attempting to become more skillful in relationship. And I'm proud of you, proud of me, proud of us for that. We will not do it perfectly. We will still have patients who leave here spin out and die. We will still have marriages that want to look like they're okay in and around here that will not sustain themselves. And maybe they shouldn't because they are no longer marriages. It's, it's complicated. But 
This place will continue, I deeply believe it, and it is here for more than 70 years because it is a sacred site like the Lord's place where people come and find connection and find the capacity to forgive and heal and restore and renew and start again and, 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 and strike the match on dead sticks to begin to kindle the fire of love and meaning. And uh, so the, the, the stakes are really high and the value of what we are about here is so beautiful. And the fact that we are trying it is almost laughable because none of us are good at it. But that doesn't mean we can't make progress. And the, I will finish. The, the best thing I know to point you to in terms of how is the wisdom of the 12-step movement as it's captured in various key phrases like one day at a time. You could roll your eyes. Oh, there they go again. But I'm telling you, I don't know a better way. And there's a mathematics to this, right? There's no successful long-term relationship that wasn't incrementally committed. Because as soon as I depart, like if tomorrow I'm going to take a vacation from my relationship, I'm going to tell you I know at least one person who's going to call that a cry foul, right? So by persisting in the covenants of a relationship one day at a time, I manifest constancy incrementally. And then let go, let God. Like this is to trust that there's a, there are things that contribute to coherence in relationships that are bizarre and mysterious and yet do. I think there are, I bet there are people in here that have marriages that have lasted 30, 40, 50 years. That, that just always just amazes me. I think it's remarkable, but it, it's usually something that people who are in those long-term relationships can say there was there were things that helped us sort of stay in the fold. And it's the trust that these things will continue to manifest and hold us in partnership that that are what we're that what I'm talking about when we say let go like God. It's to trust in the flows of a universe that delivers connection in spite of the suffering and contingency and fragility at all. So, and if we don't stay in the game, if we don't continue to play serve and return, we're walking away from the table. And you have not. So, thank you for being here. And on behalf of every patient who's terrified that you're going to abandon them, and every family member who's terrified that you're going to be abandoned, like, let's hurrah inside that we have not, any of us, totally given up. And it may be that the day is dark and you think, like, this is my last, like the musician just said, this is my last <laughs> time here. Then hopefully it'll come back for celebrating a coin, right? And, and yet, none of it is guaranteed, except that I can say that discipline, practice, faithfulness to the basic principles of one day at a time is what's necessary to have the prize manifest. So seek to be faithful today, seek to be honest today, seek to whatever extent you can to be generous and, and bring like a, a right spirit in your heart. And that, that's, that's like progress for those of us who don't know how to, how to do this much better than we have before. So God bless. I wish us each very best in constancy today.